Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks for, thanks everyone for coming. I'm thrilled with the group, and this will be a fun night. The idea is let's enjoy this, uh, and I'll give you a few, a couple of stories that I wrote out, out of the book. Actually, there's another book in progress called Autumn Winds that's already the manuscript's done. We cranked that out, as Barb said, pretty quickly. Uh, now it's just PDFing it, and so there'll be a new one coming as well. So that'll be fun. We'll have a movie to go with it and uh, an audio book uh, counterpart for anybody who prefers to, to hear it rather than to sit down and read it. So we're kind of often offering all the options. So anyway, thanks for coming, and we'll get started. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll go through a couple of the chapters. I'm going to first start with, before I do the chapters, I'm just going to tell you about a three-liner of how I got into the outfitting business, and then we'll go into the chapters and nuts and bolts of the presentation. And so back in the 70s, I, I, was, I graduated from college. I went to graduate school and got that wrapped up and went to the military, and uh, my field was artillery, so I worked in fire direction. It was really fun. I, they, they gave me a promotion to captain a little bit early and put me in charge of this fire direction center with uh, artillery battalion. And so we called in fire on the, in, in mock exercises in, in Germany, thinking that maybe the Russians will luck out and the Russians will come across the line and we'll get to use this stuff. Well, it turned out that it never happened, although we had a couple of stand downs and then finally uh, we we got out of it scot-free and we went dang it we didn't get to do that you know we, the, the culmination of all that was the chance to get to use it in real combat but we never did came close a couple of times though so anyway after that was over for I was in it for four years and I thought well this is fun but it's more of an indulgence than it is any real accomplishment so I talked the Army into letting me out of the military service. My obligation was four years, so I, they said, fine, you know, we'd love to keep you, but if you've got to get out, well, that's your choice. So away we went, and uh, the result was the real passion was to get one of these hunting camps in the thoroughfare of Wyoming where, the, where it was very remote country and a chance to really stretch the the problem solving and try to take from minimal finances the ability to, I mean, a chance to build something that was, that probably in the Army would have taken me 20 or 30 years to get to the point of influence. So that was the project, did so, and the way I got started was to buy out an existing camp from a guy because they, they built, they put these into moratorium status because there was so much interest in people wanting to go hunting and then they wanted to buy an outfit and that meant a, a camp, a remote camp, stock and all that. So the place was getting crowded, too crowded. So finally Forest Service just says, we got to put a moratorium on this and let's back off. So at that point, the result was that you, in order to acquire a business, you actually had to buy an existing one. Then, and, and of course, up goes the price because of supply, laws of supply and demand. So you're in the process of putting this together. You realize, wow, this is going to take all the money I saved in the Army, meticulously saved in the Army, and some. It's going to take some guy that's willing to finance this, and this could go on for a long time. It's like buying a house, maybe worse. So first guy I found, I, I found the camp on the map that I wanted to get and went to this guy, and lo and behold, I couldn't believe it, but it was for sale. It, what, a, you know, what a serendipitous event, so, or coincidence. So went to this guy, and he was a real interesting, neat guy. He, he, uh, he was one of these rounders who went down to Vegas every time he got any money, and for every dollar he earned, he spent two or three. And so he was broke all the time, so it turned out he was pretty easy to deal with <laughs> it, at the time. So in a way, kind of got a bargain price for that camp. It, it wasn't a steal, but at the same time, it wasn't the, the pie in the sky either. So it, it, it wound up being a pretty decent deal. So this guy, he was quite helpful in, in producing this uh, important list 
of supposed clients that were interested in going to the thoroughfare and that he had taken before and that his predecessor had taken before that and went clear back. So here's this big list, and it was on a adding machine tape from downtown Cody, Wyoming, from somebody's office down there. And it was this whole big, big strung out list that you could you could look at, and it had name after name after name after name. Some of them faded, some of them almost erased, and some of the some of the titles were hard to read. You know, the guy's first name you could read, but you couldn't read his last name. And the 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 process was a little bit tedious trying to work your way through this whole thing. Well, I went through this whole big tape, this big, and wrote all the names down and cobbled it all back together and then sent out, you know, sent my brand new brochure with some pictures on it out to these folks. And this went on, you know, had it, had it going out. It took me a month to get them all addressed and mailed and phone numbers written down and all that. Well, so it turned out I wasn't getting any response it was amazing. I, I started getting on the phone, panicky. You know, what am I going to do? No clients. Well, I called a few of them up, and a few of them said, oh, yeah, we'll, we'd like to go. Very few, as in 5% maybe. These were clients that were supposed to be established clients. Finally, I called this one, and this old lady answers. She's about 90. And she tells me that, well, that's my husband, and he's been dead for 30 years. Well, it turned out that most of these clients off this list, about 60% of them had been dead for at least 20 years. So <laughs> that, was the, that was the ball of wax, I, ball of goods I bought from this outfitter when I bought the Blue Sky Hunting Camp. So it, it, took quite, it took a couple of years to put a clientele together that was viable. Anyway, that's how I got started in the outfitting business. So it was fun, to, to say the least, to get started in this. Now... Then, okay, that was in 1979. Well, all right, go back a few years before that. And those were times when it was time to work for, as a packer and guide for existing outfitters to get experience in order to be able to do this. So here's our first story. Leading into this is a story called Smoke and Tom. And that's um, chapter four of the book. And this is a... This is a story about a, the first outfitter I ever worked for. The guy was a real guy, and, and, uh, but I probably had better not go public with his real name because he, may, he, he went to Filer High School clear back in the, in the old days in Idaho. So anyway, I wanted to get a job in, in the Selway country in Yellow Jacket Mountain, so I went and found this guy, called him up, and he hired me off the, off the phone sight unseen as a packer. Well, I'd done some packing before, and so he, you know, it's kind of like those deals when you hire a cook. You ask the, the guy, the contestant, well, can you fry an egg? And if the answer is yes, well, then you're the cook. Well, that was kind of how it is with packers, too, that, well, can you, throw a, can you throw a diamond hitch? Well, yeah. And, well, then you're the packer. <laughs> so that's how that got put together. And I, they can do both, fry an egg and throw an egg. Oh, boy, you got a double duty and pay for one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, okay, well, then, um, so this was back in the late 70s, actually in the early 70s, about 1972, 73, right in there. I was just a young guy. I was about 22 years old. And uh, so long before purchasing any any camp or anything, I went uh, went with this character, sight unseen, couple of short phone calls and a letter or two, and I'm on the middle fork of the salmon working for this guy. So we go, I hadn't gotten a chance the first time I went down there to check on it, I met the guy. And he's this tall guy, tall boots, he wore his boots outside of his trousers, and he's leaning back on a, on a tack shed, and he's got his boot on the corral rail, and there's these two cowboys in there trying to shoe horses that are giving him some trouble. And he's just sitting back in the shade, just kind of watching. He's about six foot two, and he's wearing a stomped on Stetson, you know, probably one thrown down in the ground and stomped a few times. So he's kind of looks the part, looks like the Marlboro man. He's smoking rolled camels, rolled his own, you know, like that. And uh, his hands called him Marlboro Tom, 
but I can't use that because of the potential for lawsuits, so I called him Smoking Tom in the book. <laughs> and he had this jumped on hat, and uh, okay, so I, c I come driving up, and I've got this old, old Chevy that's just a kind of a Thor banger, but it's, it's running on one lung, not two. And, it, and so he looks at that and says, oh, that guy must be from Montana. And <laughs> sure enough. So he didn't think too much of the, he asked me, he said, well, he, have you been packing much? And I said, in, well, in spite of previous conversations, he apparently wanted better proof, I thought. Time to reiterate what we had already discussed about time spent in the Bob Marshall and the Beartooths. We'd had all these talks before, but he forgot about them. Well, what the hell do those Montanans know anyway about anything? Out, so out comes the chaw, and he's fumbling with the pack and matches. He lights a, lights a cigarette. Damn podunk cowboys over there, they think they got all the answers. He, he, he just kind of had a, had a bias. Well, okay, now's test time. He says, I haven't proven myself enough to, I'm going to go to work for him at all. He tells me, I got I to gotta go shoe that horse over there and prove to him that, you know, that I can do it. So I go over, and these two hands are working there on another one. And one of them, named uh, Bill, he comes over, and he says, I said, what the hell's with this horse? He doesn't look right. He says, yeah, this is a test. He tests, he uses this horse on every hired hand that comes to work for him. So... He said, this is a setup. Now watch the hind feet on this thing. He's, he'll be perfect on his front feet, but you get around those hinds, and you, about the time you're rasping that foot, he'll jerk it away and blindside you. If he were mine, I'd tie him up. Well, okay, you've got a foot rope. Have you got the, the tools? Somebody, you know, show up and give me a hand. Bring, if you'd bring me some tools, I'll go to work and see what I can do. Well, long story short, I kind of crept around this horse. Real, kept the feet low, you know, kept the hind feet really low, didn't stress him and crept around him and got through it. And the hand said, well, Tom, maybe you ought to hire this guy. So <laughs> Tom said, yeah. And he comes up and he says, there's Petunia and there's, uh, what was the name of that other horse? There, there were a couple of them, Petunia and Buster, I think. Anyway, he said, maybe he can get those two done, too. Nobody had been able to shoe those horses, or they'd had a, it took three guys to throw them down and hog tie them. And, well, I couldn't, I couldn't shoe them either. But Tom said, if you can shoe that one over there without uh, having to throw that horse and you can get him done, there's a whiskey sour waiting for you at my house. Well, okay, I looked at that, but no, no cigar. I couldn't do it either. We, but all of us ganged up on them, and we, got, we had 20 head done by dark, and we were ready to go to the mountains. Well, it turned out that the hunters were, the new group of hunters, there were four of them. They were construction workers from Atlanta, and they're headed, they're headed there. We picked them up at the airport, and they were going into the camp the next day. So we barely, you know, we squeaked by with the, the horseshoeing and getting all this done at the last minute, and now you'll find out a little more about this Tom guy. So, okay, so we got the shoeing taken care of. We're going to meet these hunters. Uh, let's see. Okay. So Smokin' Tom comes forth and says I'm hired and that we'll be going up the trail a day later with the first group of clients, reminding him that the, that, that issue had already been decided over conversation the week prior makes no impression. He'd forgot all about. Next night, the four gunners arrive. These are the four hunters from Atlanta. And old Tom has them booked into some shady rest in the town of Salmon where they are all assigned to one room. And there's only two double beds. <laughs> I mean, this is... These guys were a little testy when they brought us their gear in the parking lot. This was, <laughs> they, they weren't liking the looks of this. These guys are from Georgia construction workers from Atlanta, and they seem pretty out of sorts in the parking lot when they bring us their duffel. So Bill and I weigh out their packs. Balancing, we've got to balance the loads within about a half a pound so they're, they're, you know, they're balanced on the trail or otherwise you're going to have blown packs and trouble. So all the while, Tom's 
getting their money. You know, he's going around, well, you, you know, you're going to have to pay me the second half and all that after their deposit. So he collects their fees, and after a short explanation detailing that he will meet them early for breakfast, he takes off in his pickup to take care of the final details. That's now that he's got the money. Just before Tom leaves, the apparent leader of the group, a fellow named Jack, asks about the accommodations in camp. He says all of his group want to know what the hell the damn sleeping arrangements are going to be. Are four of us going to have to sleep two to a cot for ten days up there? Well, Tom says there's going to be a single bunk in each in, in the tents. I mean, a one-on-one -on -one arrangement for sleeping quarters in the tents. But that it wouldn't be a bad idea if the hunters brought some, some, a few tarps and extra mattress pads. Tarps. The hunters are going, tarps, what do you mean? There's holes in these moth-eaten disasters? Finally, a second hunter named George raises an eyebrow and asks, what the hell is that supposed to mean? We've all got our own rain gear. Are there any roofs on those moldy tents? <laughs> okay, so here's what happens. Bill, Charlie, and I load up all the gear. We've got it all balanced. We've got the packs ready, ready to go, the gear in the trailer, and we head up, the three of us head up the, up the middle fork to the corrals at the base of the, of the, uh, of the yellow jacket uh, wilderness. So we're ready to go in. We're gonna, Tom's going to have breakfast with the hunters and then bring them up later. What, by the time we've got everything packed, he's going to get there, and we're all going to go in together as one big outfit. Well, it turned out, however, that the next morning we got the saddling and packing done long before Tom and the hunters showed up. Evidently, unknown to all, there would transpire quite a number of delays, some expected and some not. The first occurred when it came time to pay the bill for breakfast. The boss said that they'd all have to go Dutch because they had to save money for the, for the trip. For, to get enough groceries for the trip. You know, kind of one of those deals where you're robbing Peter to pay Paul so the hunters are supposed to go Dutch. The problem is that they had already sent their wallets and their money in their duffel. They'd inadvertently put this in their duffel and it had gone up the trail. It was with us. So Tom had to take out an IOU from the waitress for the whole rest of the hunting season to pay for the... to pay for, to pay for breakfast, and he promised he'd give the, the waitress the money back at the end of the hunting season, plus some gratuity. And she fell for it hook, line, and sinker. So anyway, so, there, so he took out an IOU loan from the waitress and, and got by through that. Finally, the waitress come up, came up with the IOU loan to the outfitter with remuneration and tip promised by the end of the hunting season. That left the hunters rolling their eyes with an I told you so expression looking at each other. You know, well, what is this? So then, he, then we went, the next stop they went to was the grocery store. Tom had a couple of boxes of grub waiting for pickup, and the checkout lady offered the butcher shop service, and they were going to slice all the Velveeta cheese, you know, that we, everybody used to use on hunting trips. Tom wouldn't let, her, wouldn't let him do it for two bits a loaf uh, or a, a brick because they were going to do that up in hunting camp with a, you know, cut. <laughs> he was going to save two bits every, every one of those. So you don't want to be wasting money. And these things are run pretty tight, pretty tight operation here. <laughs> it turned out, well, I'll tell you in a little bit. Um, then there came some more stops at the hardware store, lumberyard, tack shop, another local restaurant, and two bars to pay from the demeanors of several of the attendant proprietors, evidently delinquent bills. Then another at the filling station for two quarts of oil to feed the one-lunged coughing pickup they were all riding in. Amid a, amid a deluge of choice and chiding comments, Tom pulled into the, banking parking the bank parking lot, raised the hood, and poured the two quarts down the hatch, followed by a quick drop-off at the main office. You got that done. You got the bank taken care of. Now, this isn't in the book, but the reality of it, rumor is, that he had to, he, his two hired hands the night before had gotten into trouble, and they were in jail, so he had to go and bail them out of jail. But I didn't put that in the book because I couldn't, I, I again, was a little bit reticent to get this exposed out in public. But that's apparently what happened. See, see we were up the trail, or fixing to go up the trail at the North Fork, and uh, at the Middle Fork, and uh, uh, the, the rumor is that hunters told me later that Tom had to bail some of the help, hired help out of jail. So it was, a, it was chaos. 
Okay, finally, we got one last stop to make, and it's it's one final pickup of a horse trailer and three head of horses from the neighbor. Got to borrow that. So he goes up, picks up the horses, picks up the trailer, loads the horses. We're headed up the North Fork and danged, anyway, about 20 miles out from the corrals. The rear end of the pickup goes out, and an old bald face on the, tra on the uh, trailer goes flat. So we got two flats and one spare. So Tom goes out, offloads the trailer, out goes the, out go the horses, they're tied to the trailer. The, he's got a chain rigged to chain up the back of the trailer so it can, the left side can run on one wheel, one, t one tire. The, the hunters helped him and got the tire changed on the pickup. With the thing trussed up with this chain, he reloads the horses. Everybody helps him, you know, reload the horses there in the trailer. And this three-wheeled horse trailer and the pickup, coughing away, smoking away down the highway, comes lunging into the corrals, and he finds all of us gone. We're up the trail. We gave up on him. They, we thought, well, he's wanting us to go to camp, so we left. So here he is with, let's see, it looks like there's two pack horses in the corral and two rideable horses in the corral, his saddle horse, and that means the three borrowed horses had better be pretty darn good because that's the differential between what the hunters are going to be riding and what horses are available. So he's got to have, he's, he better be rolling dice on these three horses that are in the trailer. Long story short, he's got to break these three horses in place snub them up they won't you can't even get near them with a with horse pads let alone the brush to brush them at anything else he's in a total mess the hunters are sitting there well tom uh isn't there a better way um, uh, it doesn't take rocket science to figure out that we've got i've got to ride if you're going to ride your saddle horse and this other saddle horse is bomb proof and you're going to let frank the our ringleader ride that. That means the other three of us are going to have to ride those things that you just let out of the trailer, and they can't even trailer decently. So we're not riding these horses. We're not going up your damn trailer. We want our money back. So Tom throws the gauntlet. He says, I got a $100 bill right here in my pocket. And the hunters, of course, start laughing. No, you don't. Well, yes, I do. And you know, your money's all borrowed. Well, Okay, but I got a hundred dollar bill in my hip pocket that says you can ride those horses. Give me twenty minutes apiece. He goes out, gets near these guys, and starts sacking them out and going through the the ritual, breaking the horses. Finally, jumps on one and does a little kai and around the inside of this corral. Gets loose of the snubbing post, a little more, and he's down the road. Comes back. Graduated. First hunter gets on the horse. He puts the first guy on the horse. This went on. He finally, long story short, the, the details are in the, in the book, but we've got to go a little faster. Um, he gets all three of these, or all four of these hunters horseback, and they're all going up the trail. Here's the end of the chapter. Okay, let's see. Well, I've got an ace and a hundred dollar bill on each says you can climb on and ride them. Give me 20 minutes apiece. That's, that's the, uh, that was the crux of the story. So with Jack in the lead on Gunsmoke, Tom right behind on Highball handling the two pack stocks, Sam, George, Don, and Don pull up the rear. They've headed up the Middle Fork Trail in search of adventure. <laughs> They're looking for adventure now. <laughs> it's a... It's a 5.30, it, it is 5.30 p.m. and it ain't pretty. Nevertheless, all are on point, fully awake for what might well be coming. Smoke and Tom, fully aware that he's squeaked through on the remnants of his last ace, thinks better of reminding George about settlement, referencing that 200 bucks. Could have used it to catch up on the grub bill. Probably would have covered lots of fresh sliced yellow cheese, he laments. laments. However, bet, better to let the sleeping dog lie. 
the cl the clacking of freshly shod horses on the rocky Mil Middle Fork Trail resounds like music. In the waning light of sundown, setting in for a long night under the stars, he mumbles softly to Highball, that's his saddle horse, hold steady, old pard. That's the first, cha that's the one chapter, okay? That's chapter four out of the book. The idea being this guy was, you know, the outfitters are all a little different. The, Tom was such a fly-by-night as a businessman that you could almost not call him a businessman. He was a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants guy who could get the job done no matter what. But if you were going to try to assess this guy today, there'd be a lot of folks who would say, why isn't this guy in jail? And, but in, in the 70s, this was how it was done. Some of these old cowboys were so talented that they could get through anything no matter what, so they didn't do any planning because they already knew they had, could handle stock. They could get the job done. They were, they were actually very bright intellectually. I don't mean, uh, I don't mean classic education. I mean just bright. He, they'd find a way out of a, out of a dilemma that they got themselves into, and they got out of it every time w without fail or got majorly in, uh, injured in the process. Sometimes you got, that happened. But generally speaking, these guys pulled it off. Uh, as an outfitter, I wasn't like that. I kind of had to do things the other way. Everything calculated, everything had to be set up, prearranged, perfect ahead of time. And of course, the best laid plans go south in a hurry and turn into chaos anyway. But if you've at least got a plan and a list and a plan ahead of time, most, most of the time you can manage to salvage most of it and get through the ordeal. And that's what this other chapter is about. It's called um, Escape. And this is at the other end of the spectrum of when I was in, of the time that I pretty much was ready to hang things up another five years and I, I hung up the, the spur. But... Um, I'll go into that. Now, how are we doing for time? You're just fine. It's about six oh six. Oh, thanks. Six oh six. Yeah. If anybody knows Tom McGilvery, he bought a, a book or two. Anyway, this was his favorite book. This was his favorite chapter. Yeah. Tom is the used to be the Senate Majority Leader in Monta in Helena. Uh, anyway, he's a good friend, and he. He bought several of these books for his best friends and loved it. And uh, this was his favorite chapter. So for what it's worth, uh, I, I kind of was, I'm kind of proud of it insofar that it's the exact opposite of this smoking Tom guy. This was more the way I tried to operate. Uh, and uh, you'll see the, the difference. It, of course, none of us are perfect and you're wide open prone to Mother Nature, the vagaries of Mother Nature, and you can have all sorts of things happen that you wish hadn't. But I've always thought that if you had a list and a plan, at least you could start to cope with the major dilemmas that are going to get thrown into chaos uh, endemically. And so I will start with a little bit of Chapter 15. The one I'm actually doing is 16, which is called Escape. But you need to know a little bit of background from chapter 15 to be able to understand the rest of it. So let me say this, that uh, what I did was I had my outf outfit was in the thoroughfare, and it was in the most remote part of it. It was 40 miles into one of the camps. It was 32 miles into the other camp, which was seven miles downstream on our main drainage. Uh, there was a layover camp, which was halfway, about 18 miles. Yeah? Could you, could you explain for the uninitiated what the thoroughfare is? Sure. Sure, thanks for the question. Uh, it's, it's, the thoroughfare is actually named for two reasons. One, it, if you see it, it looks like a great big superhighway where the Yellowstone River originates and it divides into the North and South Fork and then it goes on a big journey clear through the Teton Wilderness or a big piece of it and then swings down into Yellowstone Park and is the major tributary of the Yellowstone River. The other reason was it was a route taken by the mountain men going through it to get to Jackson Hole where they wintered back in the 1800s, 
early 1800s. So the thoroughfare is applicable in some ways. The nomenclature is applicable to modern times, and it's also applicable to a thoroughfare taken by the mountain man uh, to get out to basically escape, just like we're going to do in this chapter. Is it grassy or is it? Oh yeah. Like it's metal? yeah, it's both. It's dangerous at times. <laughs> it, it certainly can be. Yeah, and you'll you'll hear um, in the in the chapter, but it uh, it's big rolling. It's beautiful mountains. You look at the Beartooths. Mm -hmm. That's like the Shoshone forest is, that circumvent the thoroughfare uh, out of Wyoming between Jackson and Cody. Okay, it's that whole chain of Absaroka Mountains that go on the periphery of the Teton Wilderness. So take picture Jackson Hole here, picture Cody here. Here's Yellowstone Park, and the circumventing uh, topography around it is the thoroughfare. Okay, and it's loaded with it. It actually once you get through the Teton or you get through the Shoshone Forest, and you get over the top of Deer Creek Pass or Ishawa Pass or Cabin Creek uh, Divide, Silver Tip, any of those four passes, you get you start to come into country that's much more rolling, uh, easier terrain, such as the interior of Yellowstone Park. And that's the thoroughfare. It's when you're outside of that and you're in this rugged, volcanic, really uh, uh, conglomerate rock, granite and conglomerate mixed, that's, the, that's still part of what we call, at this point, the Washakie Wilderness, and it's a lot rougher. But you've got to get through the Washakie to get into the into the thoroughfare. And so the thoroughfare gets easier, but you've got to pay your dues for about 17 miles to get to it. That's, and it's just rolling hills and beautiful meadows, and it's the best looking elk hunting ter territory I've ever seen. Uh, beautiful, loaded with, and lots of great fishing in the summer, good point. Really good fishing. There's a, I, it's the most remote wilderness Destination, the lower 48. Yeah. 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 The, uh, I think my two camps, 32 miles and 40 miles, were the two most remote camps of the whole lower 48 states. I kind of designed it that way when I bought the, the outfit, was to try to find something that was so far in that there wouldn't be any competition from other hunters, and there's virtually not. We, we had... Uh, Indigenous elk, probably about 1,500 indigenous elk in this area, and it was fortressed around by this big, big battlements of mountains that were that sort of protected it, and so there was virtually no competition, and we could go out and hunt all any time, and and many times, some years we even did 100 uh, percent. Some years, almost every year I was up there, we did 90 percent or better on on bull elk. So it was, it was one of those world-class places that everyone else, in order to find a comparable place, they've got to go to Mongolia to find a similarly uh, endowed place in terms of elk population. And of course, the, the big fires of 88 did nothing but enhance that, So in, at least in our area, because the fires burned from west to east and the, the herds mixed and the genetics uh, the, the, there was linkage between the park elk that got displaced and the indigenous elk that were living in, in the hunting area. And so we, they, they married up the following winter on winter range and came back there. This thoroughfare was phenomenal. Now, were the Indians aware of this before we got there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We find chipping grounds all over that country. Oh. Where, where they, 10,000 years ago, they were building these, these points. Clovis points, etc. I think is about dated about ten, fifteen thousand years ago. They're loaded. You you find them if you've got your eyes open. You'll find them. Yeah. Oh. I'm sorry. No quite. No. Uh, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. We found that and. Uh, uh, and the country is absolutely loaded with grizzlies. It got worse. Every year we were up there, it got worse, uh, it, it, partly because of, of the bureaucracy not letting us touch these grizzlies. And they, they, it, it, it was so incredible that you would find 
I'm detracting from it, but I'm so excited. I'm very excited about your questions. Your, all of your questions are tops. But the, it got to the point where you could go into that country and you could kill a bull elk at dark and head back to camp, you know, thinking, okay, we got him dressed out. We got him covered with pine boughs, pine boughs protected. The birds won't get to it. Hopefully the bears won't. And by the time you got up at daybreak, wrangled a couple of pack stock and went back, there was a grizzly on it, and you had to basically fight the grizzly to get to your get your meat back. And the, we figured out it took us a, a years, a couple of years, to really figure out what was going on. But here's the scenario: the way we proved it was with the snow. Snowfall came down. You got four inches on the on the level. Bear tracks, any kind of tracks are showing up. You go, you kill an elk, go back to camp. Horse wrangler goes out, and he's going to bring in some pack stock. You go out, and here you encounter grizzlies, grizzly tracks, circling the camp. So the horse wrangler gets curious. What's going on? Why is this thing circling the camp? He, comes out, he goes out a little further, and there's another one circling the camp the other way. And guess what happens? When he comes back and intersects the tracks from the night before where we came from where we had killed the elk, he does a 90 degrees and follows those tracks. Our tracks got blood in them, scent, uh, elk scent in them, and he follows it back and beats us to the kill before we get out there the next morning. So we're in a fight with the, you know, we, I used to always carry a 10 gauge double barrel loaded with three inch magnums. And that's what you fight the bear with. And, of course, you don't try to kill the bear. You shoot over his head or blister his behind and get your elk back and then pack, that, pack your elk back in. But, but those, those bears would circle the deal with their splendid scent, uh, sense of scent and radar going, and they would track, backtrack right to the, your elk kill. So, we, of course, what's the answer? You start packing pack stock. You take pack stock with you on your evening hunt. So we were continually double, doing double duty with the anticipation of taking an elk that night. If we thought we were going to, and you're always thinking you're going to, you're hoping, uh, here comes the pack stock with you. And you load the thing up before it's cooled out or anything and get it back to camp and hang it. That's how we, that's how we dealt with those bears. And it got worse and worse and worse every year that I was up there for 25 years to the point where when I, when I finally sold out, it was, wow, I'm kind of glad that I don't have to do that again. Because, you you know, every, every year, every season, you go through 10 or 12 of these rituals with, with grizzlies. Sometimes you start looking at your hold card. You look at the old hold card and think, well, when's my number up? Hired hands used to tell me that, I wore out the, what was it, the lives of two cats. You get nine lives out of one cat. Well, I, apparently the hired hands thought that I wore out two kitties. <laughs> anyway. I'm sorry. I, it, it's just so interesting to note that not only did those grizzlies cause a lot of trouble, but the little black bears got in on the act. You want to tell that symbiosis story? No, yeah, you want me to tell it. There, there was an incredible event that happened up there I've got to tell you guys about. And it, it, this was just one of many. I mean, it happened. It, it didn't just happen once, but it was, it was so remarkable that I'll tell you the story. We're always having, you know, you've got the, the meat rack 14 feet off the, off the deck, and you're hoisting up elk quarters. There's four elk quarters for every, every one. And they're hung as high as you can get them because these grizzlies can stand up on their hind feet and reach way up. And they can pull. If they can get any purchase whatsoever on this elk quarter, they'll pull it down and break the rope or the, or the baler twine or whatever it is that's holding it up there. And they have lunch. And they'll get another one. Well, we kept raising the meat rack, the meat pole, so high that they couldn't do that. Well... Guess what? There you go. That's a, you. Yeah, you've got it. Here's what happens: is the is Mr. Grizz sees that Mr. Black Bear went up and climbed the tree. See, a grizzly can't climb the tree after he's full grown. 
or even past cub stage, he's, his claws are slick and he's gaining too much weight and he, he slips down the tree. So here comes the black bear and Mr. Grizzly watches the black bear climb up and he gets one down and down it comes splat on the ground and Mr. Grizz comes over to black bear and says, get out of here and he eats the dinner. Well, okay, that doesn't work very well because he only gets, that, gets to do that once. So they started to make friends and had a symbiosis going. These black bears would, would go into a symbiosis with a grizzly and they would tolerate each other. Mr. Black goes up and he knocks down eight or ten of these quarters, splat, 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 splat. And Mr. Grizz, <laughs> Mr. Grizz goes over and eats. he claims half of them and the black bear gets the other half and they tolerate each other. <laughs> this happened, I swear to you. <laughs> It was mostly it happened at night. Yeah. Oh, it it was it was awesome just to see the tracks and the patterns of what how they operated. But I knew of at least two pairs that did that. That that it was really fun to, you know. So you so this got quite sophisticated. Yeah, it was fun. Hunters, well, there's in fact. You, should, you guys should buy this book because there's a chapter in here <laughs> that's called Bear Spooked from Texas. And it's the story. It's, uh, let me see which chapter it is. Um, yeah, that's it. Bear Spooked from Texas, page 137. Now that's a 10 or 12 page story of these two big fat guys who weighed like almost 300 pounds who came up there and they'd never been elk hunting before. They came up to the camp and the goofballs were... <laughs> scared absolutely to death of bears. Well, one of the mules came out from the string. He was kind of a camp pest. I had 40 of these mules, 37 of these mule, big mammoth mules that we brought. From, yeah, they were thoroughbreds. Well, yeah, he, 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 he came with me and went on one of the trips, and he rode one of these guys. They loved it. They loved it. Um, Anyway, we had these 37 red mules, and there was one named Trapper who was the camp pest. And he'd come in and eat hot cakes off of your plate, you know, and, uh, and we, the cook would feed him potatoes and, and hash browns and stuff, and he didn't care. He'd just come in. Well, he had a bad habit of going up to these hunter tents and scaring them. So he had bray really loud, and he, brayed, he went up and brayed really loud to, these, to this Texan's tent, and it's, they thought they, they had everything closed up and, the, and, and barricades erected and they had their guns loaded and they had a box of shells ready to go in the, in the, in the stove to, with all the points aimed out the door. They were going to get the bear if he came in. They, they burnt all their clothes up because they ran out of wood and they wound up, they, this wound up being an absolute disaster. And we they were, we finally we had to we had to re redo their wardrobe so we found cl clothes for them and these big fat guys and we they were trying to wear my clothes and we had them baler twined cross stitched together so they'd stay on <laughs> and and the, yeah i mean it was it was absolutely anyway read the chapter it's hilarious and and the the end of the deal was there that apparently they when they got the hunt, hunting trip over with. They did get one elk out of, out of two of them. They went home with an elk. But they bailed, and they were, they were gone in a cloud of dust out of, the, out of the South Fork country where a corral was. And we never heard from them again. In fact, it appeared that there was a moratorium after that on my outfit relative to southern hunters because we never got a phone call from a southern hunter for three years after that. <laughs> and we figured that's why is because these southern boys from Texas told everybody how bad their trip was. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, um, now what? What? Are, how are we for for time? Uh oh. Um, what? Uh, what? Do, I spent too much time answering questions. Do we? Uh, do, do we want to do this escape story? What? Or is it all right? Or well, we need to we need to close the door at seven. Everybody's got to be out. Yeah. So. Oh. You got it. You got time to find books. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well then, Tell us I'll just Tell I won't read any. I'm sorry. Tell it in your own words. There you go. We'll just yeah. 
Oh, okay, you get the idea about the camps and packing into this country and back out. The season, uh, we had the two main camps, the layover camp, the halfway camp. We're way back in, nobody, no competition. So you, as you go in there, you can't believe the logistical base that you've got to build up horse cubes, human, I mean, staples for humans, you know, cans of beans, cans of hash browns, you know, all this, all the stuff that's got to be logistics to support the operation. You, t you pack most of that in ahead of time in August, after the summer trips end, then we refitted, reshot all the, all the mules, got everything ready to go, packed up, and we took 120 loads of stuff back into the thoroughfare to get the three camps ready. Okay, so you get the idea, and then every, every hunting trip, you're adding more of it because you realize that what's going to happen at the end by November, what, when the season closes down in November, we're going to be facing horrible weather. You know, there, there, there's going to be drifts of eight foot on the passes, and it's really going to get rough. So we better make sure we don't get marooned up there with no food. And the stock as well. You pack cubes, horse molasses cubes and stuff for the, for the stock. Okay, long story short, we... Uh, the, this happened maybe five years out of 25. I remember two years we got out of there, we scot free, we pulled dry camps, and there, you know, we just had a nice dry run coming out, no sweat. Even the passes were just a little ice. But this, but five of the years we had horrific snow, lots of lots of trouble, avalanches, lost horses. I mean, you you you're going to lose stock. Anyway, we got off pretty good, pretty well, considering the statistics for most everybody else. We kind of fared well. But there was a threshold at which when you tried to go out the conventional way and get out to the southeast, you had to cross these 10,000-plus foot passes, and there were three of them. We crossed two passes every trip we made, Silvertip Pass, Ishua Pass, and then the alternative was Deer Creek Pass. Anyway, those passes got really rough when, when the weather did. Long story short, we got into, in about 1989, we headed out, went up the trail to go out. We're loaded. We got 71 head of stock, 40 head of pack stock, and 30, 30 more of, of spares and empties and hunter horses. We had 18 saddle horses. So I guess we had about, no, we had 48 head of pack stock, we had, and there were 18 head of saddle horses and five more. So it was a total of 71 head on the trail at one time. It was a half a mile out. Yeah. yeah. And we, long story short, we're headed up, and we get up to the Deer Creek Pass. It's just at dark. It's about 10 degrees out. Wind's blowing like crazy off. You can see way over in the sun going down, and there's the Tetons. Beautiful sight. And you're looking at that saying, boy, this is going to be a long night. So out come the scoop shovels. We carried five, six scoop shovels, and everybody starts shoveling. It's a, it's a third of a mile to the top of the pass. You'll see pictures of it in here. Um, anyway, so we're headed to the top of that pass, and we get, by midnight, we're still short. We're still not there. So I get to hiking up there, and this snow is this deep. I mean, it's six, seven, maybe worse, windblown worse, sometimes way worse. But the danger is the fact that the snow blows over and it cornices over. That's the danger, is that then you don't know whether you're over air on a 1,200-pound horse or you're over trail if your memory is absolutely perfect in the dark. And I've been over that trail 500 times, over that pass 500 times, and I still can't do it. In, in the dark, what, you know, I couldn't do it to this day, not be, to be positive that we're not over the cornice instead of over the trail. So here's what happens, and it happened to friends of mine. They went through the cornice 600 feet to the deck and lost half their outfit. You got to go down and shoot half the horses because they're broken up, their legs are broken. Luckily, luckily in the last 10 years, nobody lost any folks. But anyway, long story short, we get up to the top, it's impossible. It's unconscionable. And you'll, you can read about it in the pulling camps part. Okay, so we've so we got to turn around. Well, think about it. We're in five feet of snow on the level 
with horses that get paranoid in claustrophobic snow situations and they want to jump and, and run and run you over. They'll run you over and it's really dangerous. It's pitch black out. It's midnight. Wind blowing about 40 miles an hour. And we got to, I mean, we've given up on the pass. We're just, it's unconscionable to go over this pass. So we got to turn this whole half a mile long pack train and hunters and clients, 18 of us, around a 180 and go out. How are we going to do that? Well, it was by the grace of the boss, of the big boss. We made it and we did it, got it, we pulled it off the first time and headed out. And guess what? Back to camp. Empty camp. The whole camp's on the pack string. There's, there's nothing there but familiar trees. So we're sitting there. We unpack. Everybody's exhausted. We, three hours later, we've got everything put away. We've got rows of packs, rows of gear, Stocks turned out and fed the last of the horse cubes, almost the last of the horse, horse cubes. We saved four bags for when we escaped. The, es the escape is the other chapter. So here we are. We're lying down asleep under familiar trees, and you cannot believe how comforting it was to get back to that camp with familiar trees, at least something familiar. So here we roll out bedrolls under, oh, I remember, the, yeah, that's, the, that's our favorite tree that the hook the cook tent hooks up to you know it's it's just like this big relief of stress that you're actually back to someplace familiar so okay final chapter escape three days later we're contemplating what's the alternative we're not going to make it over deer creek we're not going to make it over ishawa pass either so we got to go out some way what's the alternative Southwest, Jackson Hole. So it's 47 miles out to Jackson Hole, Turpin Meadow. That's the, that's the drill, and we pack everything up. Long story short, we, let, we rest up the stock. We rest up ourselves. We get everything thawed out and all the ice off of the lead ropes, which are impossible to work with, or lash ropes that are frozen. You can't, I mean, you have to thaw them out. And then you get one chance. If you dunk them in the creek when they take a drink of water, you're back... In, out of commission again. So you tie them up very, very carefully. Every, every one of those 71 head has got to be tied up just right because if you blow it and they go down to take a drink of water and it freezes the front part of the lead rope, bad news. How do you work with it? It's impossible in 10 degree weather. They're just iced up all terrible ver gloss all over the ropes and you can't even, there's, there's no way you can tie a knot with it. It's a mess. So you have to be meticulous about what you do with those ropes. Okay, so anyway, the escape story is, the, is, is this epic 20-hour escape on the trail in 10 degrees. Some of, it's, we're, some of it goes down to 25 below, and we made it. And so here's the end of it. The, the, the making it really is some great description. I, I, people tell me it was great description at least, and I, I'm sorry I can't read it to you because we're out of time. But um, anyway, I'll read you the last part of it. Okay. We've got time? Well, we've got to be out by 7. Oh, okay. We won't. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's what the hunters say. So we're the last ones out of here. Well, no, not out of here. We're on the Buffalo Trail now. We're, we're in Buffalo Valley. We've come over Trail Creek Divide. Now, this is on the Atlantic Creek side of the, of the mountain, so we're in the Jackson country now, not the, not the thoroughfare. We just escaped the thoroughfare. Now we're in the Jackson country, and we've got about, 30, about 20 miles left to go to the trailhead. So we're the, the Alabama hunters are saying, so we're the last ones out of here. No, nah, not out of here, but from the thoroughfare, yes. Well, okay, we hang out and thaw out for an hour, then it's boots and saddles. The Alabamans and Texans built us these two great big monstrous bonfires. They're as big as this front part of this room, two of them. And we just thawed out in 25 below weather, and everybody's got chill blains, and everybody hurts, and it, it, was, it was pretty rough. Um, okay, we hang out and thaw out for an hour, then it's boots and saddles. Another hour and a half, and we're off the switchbacks and in the North Fork. 
That's the North Buffalo, the North Fork of the Buffalo River, which is Jackson flows into the Snake River. So we're in front of the Tetons, starting to see the Tetons. The Tetons are locked in afternoon alpenglow mist, reflecting an ambience unique to the valley. We push groups of elk ahead of us, joining the timeless ages of their rituals en route. Remarkable that the mule deer seem to be traversing orthogonally. They're going, the, they're going 90 degrees to the elk, opting for obtuse migration routes in near opposition to those of the majority of elk numbers. Many appear to originate in eastern Idaho and northwestern Wyoming, the Tetons, of course, then traverse the Atlantic Creek, Yellowstone, and Thoroughfare River country, finally for the winter months, winding up on far to the east of the Continental Divide on the Shoshone and Grable River watersheds. They wind up from coming clear from Idaho. They wind up over on the Grable. This is, this is orthogonal, 90 degrees to the, to the elk migration. Well, why? Nobody knows. It's like the big boss has dyslexia. It's, it's like you just marvel at this stuff. Why would that happen? So no idea. We cross the forks of the Buffalo River, 15 miles to go. We ride the final miles amid the second cycle hours of our dark epic. Likely those southern boys are so numb by now that there's not a complaint left in them. At least there's no sign of any. The stars are fully out and under cloudless skies we travel into the void under constellations set apart by showers of meteors and an unusual brightness of galaxy accentuated by substantial coldness. Amid imaginary shadows of the Tetons, time seems to stand inert. The saddle horse plods along, keeping time with the stillness on an endless march from a timeless place. We pull into the corrals at Turpin Meadow a couple hours prior to midnight. It's absolutely pitch black, but there is light in the faces of the riders and in the eyes of our horses. Those who are able to lend a hand help us unpack stacking gear and game in long rows for loading on the trailers and trucks. The stock we leave saddled with cinches looser to ensure warmth for the long haul back to the South Fork. In the meantime, the vehicles arrive and we proceed to load them up another 340 miles and we'll mothball this colossus on the show shown, patching up the gear all winter for another go next year. So we still had 340 miles of driving to do after we'd been awake for about two, two and a half solid days on no sleep. Ah, yes, and I'd forgotten. There's still 20 loads left back in camp we didn't have room for on the pack stock. Ah, yes, and in this sleep-starved stupor, I nearly forgot. Got to go back with 20 head for that last set of packs we left in camp. Hope somebody is willing to go with and that we'll not have to shovel the passes. Wishful thinking. And so nearly 40,000 miles later, this is 40,000 miles horseback in 25 years. This is the truth. Well, partner, I hope you like this book. May you keep that old pedal to the metal and when amid them rattlers, grizzle bars, and kamikazes on the fly. Those are the hornets that come and get your pack train and blow it up. We used to call them kamikazes. Uh, May you keep that old pedal to the metal and when amid them rattlers, grizzle bars, and kamikazes on the fly, never forget to keep your powder dry. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great, great group.